Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Drs. Elise Kramer and Stephanie Wu. We're going to be speaking about marketing your myopia management practice. Drs. Kramer and Wu have specialty contact lens practices dedicated to helping patients with contact lens needs achieve great success. Both doctors have extensive backgrounds in speaking and consulting, and both have a unique insight in how to grow specialty contact lens practices. Optometric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Well, thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. We're joined by uh, Stephanie Wu and Elise Kramer, two amazing practitioners in the world, especially contact lenses. And uh, I am I'm so honored to have both of you. Thank you for joining me on the Myopia Podcast. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, excited to be here. Thank you. Uh, well, ladies, as you know... <clears throat> Talking with parents about myopia is, uh, is not something that comes naturally. You know, in our keratoconus world, many times when we get a patient that's referred into us, they know they have this condition or they, you know, have been made aware that they need something special. Uh, but, you know, that myopic family, that myopic kid, the, the parents are coming in and they find out their child is myopic and then they're like, okay glasses are the way to go because that's what I did as a kid. How, how do we start this conversation about myopia being a disease or the, the need for a, a kiddo to go into myopia management? How do you set the framework or plan things out for discussion on the future treatments you're going to provide for a, a, a kiddo? Well, I remember when I, I, I was in optometry school and even during my residency, having kind of that same question. And I had asked this question at the ortho K meeting, uh, vision by design when I was a resident, because there's so many people there that have been practicing for many years and they love educating about this stuff. And I remember that Jeff Walleen told me that when in their clinic, they ask the patient or they tell the patient, let's say there's a kid that comes in and they are, they've developed myopia. So now it's our job to educate the parents on what myopia is, especially if they don't have any correction. And then he said that what he would do is say, well, there's a couple options we have. So they can do glasses, uh, which is, you know, you probably have lots of friends and family that wear glasses to correct their vision. We can do contact lenses or we can do myopia control. And that was the key because most parents would say, what's myopia control? And then mm -hmm. that kind of opens the door. So I have used that technique in my, in my own practice. Um, I'm super curious to hear what Dr. Kramer does. So I, um, it's a <clears throat> challenge for sure. And one of the things that I think is important is that although we all recognize myopia as being a disease, I think we have to be careful with that word when we speak to patients. I, I, I tend to use the word condition a lot more, even when talking about other things, like you said, keratoconus, I just think it's like a softer, easier word. And they, a lot of the time when, I, when I'm doing you know, the refraction and then I tell them that they have myopia, they're already in shock sometimes. And so it's hard to then take that from, okay, you need a correction to now we have to start an intervention. And I, I find that challenging, but it's very important. And I also have myopia. So I like to use myself as, and relating to the patient, I also have myopia and I use this, but when I started wearing contacts, this technology wasn't available. And then I talked to them about the different treatments we have. I explained to them what myopia is, what happens if we let it progress. I show them with diagrams. I show them with little like eye anatomy, uh, like uh, figures that I have in the office. And, um, and then I explained to them the importance of 
how we all do prevention now in medicine and not just treating when we find something. Like for example, COVID, people get vaccine because they want to, they don't want to get sick. And um, sometimes with a parent, like uh, that, that, I will say we do Botox because we want to prevent, you know, getting wrinkles. So whatever it is, now we're practicing a lot more prevention than we used to. And so instead of just correcting something we know is going to get worse, we also, as physicians, try to prevent it, try to prevent it from getting worse. Mm-hmm. And that's what mm-hmm. I use. And it's been working really well. Is there is there a, a favorite statistic or a, a, a favorite talking point that you say, here's the reason why we need to do prevention with this condition um, that, that you talk about? Do you, do you talk about the pathology risks? Do you talk about um, the lifestyle risks of, you know, needing glasses to do sports or those sort of things? What, what, what do you kind of lead with? So what, what I use all the time is the uh, Brian Holden Vision Institute calculator. I, I show that to them on a screen. I show them their age, you know, and I put in the number and I show them where they'll go if we don't do a treatment, where they'll go maybe if we do one. And that's a great tool to use. And I al- always talk to them. Uh, almost everyone knows what glaucoma is. So that's a good one to use when you say it increases their risk of glaucoma or cataracts or, you know, macular. And I, I name all of them. And one really good point also that people are really interested in is actually doing LASIK. And I say it's way safer and less risky to do LASIK on someone who's minus two than minus eight, because the higher the myopia is, the more tissue you need to remove, the more tissue you need to remove, the higher the risk is of developing complications. And so a lot of them are like, well, I want my kid to do LASIK. And so that's one of the things I use, but definitely not the only, I always talk to them about the potential risk of pathology as well. Mm -hmm. What do you, what about you, doctor? Yeah, I do something similar. So when I'm explaining to the parents uh, about myopia, I I tell the parents, you know, with glasses, I can make your kids glasses this thick. I can make them super thick. That part is not really the, the hugest issue for me as the eye doctor personally. The thing that matters to me and which and should matter to you too is the increase in eye diseases as they get worse and worse. So for me, this the big kind of take home message that I want the parents to at least be aware of is that their child is going to be more at risk for glaucoma, retinal detachments, macular degeneration, you know, all these different things. And that if that is something that we can prevent, like Dr. Kramer said, why wouldn't you do that for your child? If you knew that there was something that you could possibly do to prevent that from happening in the future. And I think that that is very powerful for parents to hear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now let's switch the conversation and they say, okay, uh, I don't like, you know, with Dr. Wu, with what you kind of presented is I don't, I don't want to do the the glasses or the contact. I want to do the myopia management. You've convinced me in that. I, I want to find a way to slow this down. Talk to us about presenting options and how you go about that. And in addition, how you prioritize them or if you prioritize them for the, for, for the family. Yeah. So I really think this is an art, meaning that every patient is totally different. Their prescriptions are different. Their topographies are different, their family situations different, um, and the parents' comfort level. You know, so some parents are much more comfortable putting an eye drop in their child's eye once a day than, and, and way less comfortable with the thought of them wearing contact lenses at a young age. And then the opposite is true. Some parents do not want any sort of pharmacological intervention at all. They want to do something more contact lens based. So. I try to have the conversation and I narrow down the options based off of what that patient is a good candidate for. So, you know, if they're a minus 10 already, you know, they're not going to be a candidate for my site, you know, let's say. So whatever that particular patient is kind of showing, you know, at that initial visit or the consult, I will say, okay, based off of Jimmy's um, age and uh, shape of, of his eye and his prescription, These are the viable options that I think we can go down 
uh, these routes. Uh, and I explain each one and then I answer questions. So in my practice, doing atropine is much cheaper than doing orthokeratology, let's say. So if price is a huge factor for the parents, they might say, you know what, we just don't have the funding to do ortho K this year, but you know, we want to at least do something. So let's do, do the atropine. So I like to just kind of lay out the options that they have and kind of go over some of the pros and cons and then answer a lot of questions that the parents might have. Mm -hmm. How about you, Dr. Kramer? So I agree. Uh, it's definitely case by case. Um, and it, it, I really don't have a preference that this is my go-to treatment for everyone. I sure. think um, one of the superior treatments is orthokeratology because in addition to slowing down the progression of myopia, it gives visual freedom during the day. So less, you know, don't have to worry about um, gla glasses or contact lenses during the day. Um, and for that, and you know, they're custom made. So I think that is definitely the superior treatment. And I tell parents that, um, but my rule for contact lenses is that both the child and the parent have to be on board. And so for example, sometimes the child comes in and wants contact lenses, but the parents are not ready. And sometimes it's the other way around either way. If they're not on the same page, I don't do it. I don't, they can go somewhere else, but I don't do it if not, if both people don't agree. So if they're not ready for contact lenses, I go to atropine and atropine is fairly simple. And if it's done, it works. And we have a lot of studies that show that. I also like to present brochures, neutral brochures, so not branded, that, sh that show that myopia management is a real thing because a lot of people have never heard of it when they come into the office. And so I don't want them to think that I made it up and it, it is a real specialty and it is practiced around the world. And that the three treatments that I implement in my practice are widely recognized and have been shown to work and, and many of them are FDA approved. So mm -hmm. um, I have, I present all of the options, even if I, even if they're like no to contact lenses, I say, you know, we can always switch from one treatment to another. So for example, you can start with atropine and then you can switch over to another treatment when you're ready. Uh, just like in Dr. Wu's practice, the atropine is less expensive than the other ones, um, the other the contact lens options. So for price reasons, uh, people might choose that one. Um, but again, you, you need visual correction during the day. So they're going to have to buy glasses. They're going to have to buy contact lenses. So, yeah. So sometimes, you know, the, the thing about atropine is, uh, I think I, I'm probably shouldn't make this joke, but sometimes when we think about atropine and the costs, we're a little myopic with regards to it because there is additional costs that go into a child having uh, an atropine prescription with regards to their spectacle lenses and so forth. And, you know, kids are more likely to break glasses, so they may have to get more than one pair throughout the year. So it just kind of kind of depends in, in, in the different practice scenarios. So uh, I agree with you. That's an important point that we need to kind of keep at, at the forefront. What about um, what about the, uh, the 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 breakdown of what you're telling them for follow up visits? What is it going to take uh, to go into myopia? How do you describe that at the forefront? You know, this is something we're going to try this year, or this is something we're going to be doing for several years. How do you lay that out for them, uh, Doctor Wu? Well, that's a really important conversation to have in the very beginning because a lot of times parents might think oh, this is just a one-time thing, or, oh, they just need this contact lens and, and it's done. And, and they don't realize that this is something that we have to, we have to monitor to make sure that the treatment's working. We might need to make changes to the lenses if we're not getting optimal treatment or if the lens isn't fitting correctly and such. So that is a conversation I have right at the consultation that, okay, if we go down, you know, let's say a, con a soft contact lens option, this is what we're looking at the fitting, the dispense, your insertion removal training, and you know two follow-up visits or something. Whereas with Ortho-K, I always tell them, well, the very first day that we get the lenses, we're going to try them on, I'm gonna do some testing, and I need to see the child back the very next morning so I can see what has happened overnight. 
and then the following week. And then there will be other follow-ups depending on what's going on with the lens. So I, I always tell the parents exactly what to expect for that first year. And then they always ask about uh, subsequent years. So they always want to mm -hmm. know, okay, year two, am I doing this all over again? Do I need to get them a new pair of lenses, you know, and, and you know, or with, with atropine, is this something that we have to do indefinitely? So I think that's really, really important to, to have that conversation in the very beginning. Otherwise there could be some expectations that aren't, aren't met. Dr. Kramer, when you have an appointment with a patient regarding myopia management, is this something you, you do at their annual exam or is this something you bring them back for uh, a subsequent year? I'm sure there's patients that get referred to you, but what about the patients who you did an eye exam on them? Is it same visit or separate visit? That's a great question. Um, I am afraid, and I don't know if this is just a demographic thing in South Florida, but I'm afraid they're going to be lost to follow up um, if I don't do it right away. If I say, hey, I want to do a myopia management consultation, please come back next week. I'm afraid they'll never return. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that from experience, because people no show a lot here, that's an issue that we have. Uh, in general. So I like to do it day of because I feel like I'm, I don't know, I just feel like I'm taking better care of them that way and I'm giving them the options right off the bat. And then if they didn't go through with it or they didn't come back, then at least I was able to educate them. Because for me, the most, one of the most important parts of myopia management is education, is parent education. Because at least if they choose not to do it, and they come back next year and their kid doubled their prescription, it's not a shocker because I told them it was going to happen. And so I, that is the, the first goal of myopia management, I think, is education. So I do it right away. So let me follow up that question by asking, what about somebody who gets uh, sent into your practice? Let's say one of your referring doctors that refers to you for other specialty contact lenses says, hey, you need to go uh, see Dr. Kramer for myopia management. Do you set that up as a, as a consultation and then you bring them back and do the fitting or whatever later? Or, and, and what, how do you set up the fee for that first visit where you don't know anything about the kid? Right. So a lot of the time they'll come with notes from their previous doctor. If I examine, if all we do is talk, if all they want is information, it's happened to me before that I haven't charged them. If they come in and I start testing them, I, I always recheck the refraction. And then if I start fitting them for a contact lens or if I start you know, setting them up for the atropine program, I charge them 275. That's my fee. And that includes a consultation and all the testing I need to do. And then if they start a myopia management treatment, regardless of what it is, I see them every four months. I find that with atropine, if I don't check to make sure they're using their drops, sometimes the compliance is just not there. Whereas the other treatments, orthokeratology, my site, and, and other you know, off-label treatments, what I do is I also see them every four months because I want to make sure that the treatment is centered, if it's ortho -K, that it's doing well, that there's no, it's not progressing. And I also measure axial length twice a year. So I like to see them every four months, regardless of what treatment it is. And that's included in the cost of whatever the treatment is that they're doing. But the mm -hmm. consultation alone is where I'm going to have the conversation and I'm going to do my initial measurements for whatever treatment it is that we're doing. So what's the difference between just a chat and then what you charge this, this <laughs> fee for the, not, not the myopia management treatment, but the $200 or whatever you charge for who, who are those people? Why does that differ? So, I mean, I, if a patient comes in and they, all they did was get information, but they didn't move forward, which means they're, they're choosing not to move forward. I kind of feel bad, like charging them for just having a conversation. If I, as soon as I start measuring things, whether it's HV, uh, whether I start them with an atropine treatment, measure their axial length or, you know, do anything that I need. Then there's a fee. Then there's a fee. Yeah. 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 Just a conversation Any... that we could have had on the phone sure. 
I feel bad, you know, charging them. So uh, do you do anything different, Dr. Wu? Yeah, so I agree with Dr. Kramer that when I had my other practice where it was traditional optometry and I would see patients, um, I would have the conversation right then. Because if a parent was like on the fence of, oh, wait, I, this might be an option for my child, then they wouldn't maybe go out to the optical area and get glasses right away. So I have that conversation right away about these are the different options you know, do you want to talk about some of, do you want to explore this more? And then we can kind of go down the route of, do we need to do like an official consult where we check the shape of their eye, this and that. But I agree with Dr. Kramer that you want to have that conversation like at that regular comprehensive exam, because otherwise they may never show back up for the consult. Yeah. In my new practice, when we're just now, we're just doing specialty lenses. So it's mostly referral based. We have a system in place where we have a consultation for myopia management. So it's, it's a flat fee and that it includes the consultation, the testing, some of the similar testing Dr. Kramer mentioned, and then talking to uh, one of the doctors about the different options for their child and seeing if that's something they want to go through with. Uh, a lot of doctors do free consults. I know a lot of my friends do. I, I have a friend in Southern California. He does free consults for ortho K or myopia management. And I guess just in my practice, anytime I did free consults, there was like so many no-shows, like so many. So we started incorporating a fee and our, our uh, capture rate and, and, our, and our show up rate is much better now, even if it's just a, a small nominal yeah. fee. Yeah. Yeah. We, we do the same thing. And I think uh, we experienced the same thing that you experienced is we did free consultations for a very long time, thinking that even if not everybody moved forward, uh, it was yeah. worth the, the cost or the investment to educate people. So now we charge a ridiculously small amount of money. Uh, for people to come in for a consultation and we have this, you know, discussion and visit with them. And if they move forward with a myopia management, we actually credit that back included in the cost of the, so it's, it basically was a free visit for them then. Um, but if they don't move forward, then at least we had a little bit, made a little bit of money off of their time. Uh, we're getting paid a little, you know, for our expertise and our discussions with them. And if they decide that they want to go somewhere else and get myopia, management done, then, you know, we were able to educate and be part of that for them. So, you know, I, I, I would encourage people to have something set up for how are you going to deal with those people who, you know, don't move forward, but you've scheduled them for a visit and how do you deal with that? But, but also the important aspect of how do you have this discussion briefly with somebody at the end of an eye exam and then be able to move forward with them because it can be a long conversation just having that those types of discussions with people. So a really critical part. Um, well, I, I learned a lot. I think I, I got some great uh, tidbits here of how to talk to myopic parents uh, about uh, myopia for their children, how to talk to, uh, to families about moving forward, presenting different options for you. I sure appreciate your guys' uh, perspectives on this, and uh, it's always good talking with you ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Please stay tuned for future episodes. If you link, uh, if you like and subscribe, we'll make sure that you are aware of what happens next. And uh, please leave us a five-star review so we can get uh, more knowledge about what is important to you on the Myopia Podcast. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.